systemic steroids now inhaled. Um, so I'm Sayed and um, I'm the one of the first year fellows uh, and this is Journal Club. This is the topic of uh, presentation. This article actually came out uh, in CHEST in uh, August 2015, uh, so some months back. I don't have any disclosures. I'm going to start off uh, my presentation with a question, because uh, you guys like questions so much. Um, a 52-year-old man comes to uh, your outpatient clinic for optimization of COPD, uh, which was recently diagnosed by his family physician. Uh, he slows his walking speed because of shortness of breath and has to stop frequently. Uh, he is on albuterol BID but has minimal, minimal relief. Uh, he has had frequent chest colds requiring antibiotics twice in the last year. Uh, he has a 30 pack year history of smoking but quit seven years ago. Uh, the only medication is albuterol. Uh, no significant past medical history. Uh, in the clinic, he's 99% on room air. Uh, vitals are within normal limits. Uh, physical exam uh, reveals a prolonged expiratory phase. Um, uh, chest x-ray showed hyperinflation, and then you do a spirometry. Uh, the post bronchodilator spirometry shows an FVC of 72% and FVD one of 55% and the ratio 0.57. Uh, what interventions are most appropriate next? So you guys can just look at this question and then I'll get back to this question when uh, I'm done with my background. It's a little elaborate, the background, I just wanted to get a good feel uh, of uh, the inhaled corticosteroids in COPD. So I might take like, it might take 15, 20 minutes in the background and then I'll go to my article. Uh, so COPD, uh, like uh, it's the fourth leading cause of death uh, worldwide. Uh, it's defined as a persistent airflow limitation that is usually progressive and is associated uh, with the chronic inflammatory changes. It's a global health problem, and uh, these are numbers from the NIH uh, in 2009 and 10 uh, that uh, COPD uh, uh, 10 years ago, the, cause, the, the direct costs were 29.5 billion and indirect were 20.4 billion. I don't know if this was in the, in the last 10 years, but uh, that's a lot of money. Um, so understanding uh, uh, COPD, so we see uh, in the clinic these, uh, these clinical outcomes of COPD, you have chronic bronchitis, emphysema, and airway disease, and then uh, the pathogenesis of, uh, of COPD. There's a lot of inflammation uh, and peribronchial fibrosis that leads to airway limitation. And, and in the clinic, the best uh, test that we have to, for airway limitation is when we do a spirometry. Uh, going further, uh, diagnosing COPD, uh, like I mentioned, having symptoms, and then when we do a, a spirometry, we see the post bronchodilator ratios that are less than 0.7 uh, confirm that there is persistent airflow limitation, which is consistent with COPD. Um, the reason I actually went into these, uh, these scorings uh, uh, used in, in the clinic to assess a patient's symptoms is because the studies that I'm going to review actually use these scoring methods, so just go over them quickly. Um, so we use these four uh, scoring systems uh, questionnaires to assess how uh, the patients are doing regarding their symptoms. Uh, the CAT is what we use uh, in our clinic uh, pretty regularly. Uh, you can score from 0 to 40, uh, and again, you have five questions from a range of not having any symptoms, which is a 0, and then five uh, when you cough all the time and produce time a lot. So, uh, and then the goal guidelines use the limit of 10. If you're less than 10, then your symptoms are less uh, controlled, but then if you're more than 10, then uh, you're poorly controlled. Uh, the MMRC scale uh, used uh, pretty widely too. It just tells you about how short of breath they are. Uh, going from zero to four, worsening short of breath as, as the number progresses. And then we have the St. George Respiratory Questionnaire. I'd never used it. Uh, it's a really long questionnaire, and th I guess that's why we don't use it. But studies use it a lot. Uh, basically, this has two parts to it, uh, uh, the symptoms part and the activity part. So they, And then every part has like um, uh, questions uh, related to it. And then uh, what they do is they score from 0 to 100, and higher score uh, indicates more limitation. Lastly, the questionnaire is the clinical COPD questionnaire. It's kind of like the St. George uh, clinical questionnaire, but it's shorter. They, they have the two divisions, two symptoms and activities, and then uh, patient score uh, from zero, zero to six. 
Okay. Uh, moving forward, while assessing COPD, uh, we assess the airflow limitation, and these are the, the stages that we uh, see per the spirometry that we do in the clinics. Uh, mild to very severe, grade one uh, uh, to four. We all know this. And then when we put everything together uh, while we assess a patient with COPD, uh, we classify them into, uh, into groups by the uh, goal classification, and then we decide what treatments uh, do they need. Uh, so a patient uh, with high risk or uh, less symptoms is C or high risk and high symptoms is uh, D and then you decide which uh, medications would work uh, for them. Now before I, I actually went into the background and, and, and reviewed these articles, I actually thought it was a pretty straightforward decision of giving inhaled corticosteroids in patients with COPD. If they fall in C or D, we can just go ahead, uh, pull the trigger on it. And, and what do you guys think about this question after going through this? What, what should we do with this guy? Not everybody at once. <laughs> <laughs> Allah? Okay, yeah. So this, uh, I wanted this question to transition into the role of inhaled corticosteroids and, um, um, and COPD. Um, so basically, I reviewed some articles that started off in 2000. So this is uh, for my background, and I'm just going to tell you a couple of lines about these articles, and then link them to my study and how they're, uh, why I thought they were important to discuss. So this is a study that came out in the British Medical Journal uh, in 2000. This was a randomized uh, placebo-controlled trial, and what they did was they had two arms, an intervention arm where they would give uh, fluticasone. 500 BID uh, to patients and then they had the placebo arm. Uh, what they were looking for uh, primarily was uh, an FEV1 decline. They actually uh, followed these patients uh, for a year and uh, the population group was 40 to 75 years of age, uh, smokers, and they didn't find any significant difference in FEV1 in patients uh, in the intervention arm and, and the placebo arm. They did all uh, fi find that the people in the intervention arm had lesser exacerbations, almost 25% less than the patients in the placebo group, uh, and had a slower decline in the health status, which they uh, measured by these questionnaires. So this is another study. This came out in CHEST in 2007. Uh, this is basically uh, a pool analysis. They called it the IZEEK study, inhaled steroid effect on evaluation in COPD. Uh, the, the, the original study actually pooled uh, seven long randomized control trials, uh, which were actually done for more than 12 months. Uh, the initial study found that there was a decrease in mortality in patients who were using uh, inhaled corticosteroids, and then they did an analysis whether or not the FEV1 was affected. Uh, they found that in the first six months, actually, the patients using inhaled corticosteroids um, had an improvement in their FEV1 um, compared to the placebo. Uh, but in after six months and going forward, they found that they didn't have any further improvement and the FEV1 continued to decline like the placebo. So just a, a six month uh, benefit. And they also found that male gender and smoking affected the uh, FEV1. And if, uh, and if they quit smoking, it uh, helped with the FEV1 improvement. This one came out in 2008 in the Blue Journal. Uh, this is basically a post hoc analysis of the TORCH study. Uh, the TORCH study was a randomized double uh, blind uh, placebo control trial, kind of like the study that I'm uh, going to review the follow up study. Uh, what they had was they had an arm with inhaled corticosteroid, an arm of a combination, and then uh, a lava separately, and then uh, a placebo. And uh, their primary endpoint was all cause uh, mortality uh, at three years. Uh, so this was the original study, but the post-hoc analysis that was uh, published uh, in the Blue Journal in 2008, they looked at the FEV1 decline. And uh, they found that the lowest FEV1 decline was in patients using inhaled corticosteroids um, and a LABA. So the combination helped the most uh, in the post-hoc analysis. This one is a, uh, a review of almost 55 articles, um, and they had 16,000 patients. Um, and they, again, reviewed uh, inhaled corticosteroids for stable, moderate to severe uh, COPD. 
they found that uh, there was no benefit uh, in FEV1 decline in patients using ICS alone or as a combination. Uh, they found that there was, uh, the death rates were unchanged in, in this pool review, but they did find that there was uh, reduced exacerbation in patients who were using inhaled corticosteroids. Um, lastly, uh, this one came in uh, JAMA in 2014, uh, and um, this was a retrospective cohort uh, study which was done from uh, 2003 to 2011. What they actually mention in, uh, even in the abstract and afterwards a lot of time is they wanted this to be a real world study. So they said that what we wanted to look at was that in the real world what you see is old patients with COPD. So what they, uh, the, p the patient population they saw was patients above 66 years of age and um, they had asthma. They didn't exclude the people with asthma. So they just wanted old people um, and they, they said this is a real world study because you're gonna see people with asthma and COPD crossover. Uh, again, Somebody doesn't know how to page. <laughs> <laughs> now they're learning. Um, yeah, this is a number of um, so, um, so they wanted this to be a real world study, and they uh, their primary outcome was death uh, and COPD related hospitalization. So they compared ICS LABA combination uh, with just a LABA. The, uh, so they uh, that's all. Uh, those the LABA was the the control, and then what they found was there was a modest uh, statistically significant r risk reduction in death at five years in, in the combination group. So that's the only study that I actually, when I was reviewing, found that they actually found that there was some reduction, uh, risk reduction in uh, uh, death at five years. Uh, when they did a subgroup analysis, they found that the patients who had the most benefit and, and had the most risk reduction were the patients who actually had asthma as a co-diagnosis with COPD. Those were the patients who actually got most benefit from the, the combination. So the debate still continues uh, about inhaled corticosteroids and COPD. I, I won't go into all these. Um, so what does uh, the goal guideline say? So this is from 2016, um, and they actually start off by saying that inhaled corticosteroids um, within COPD, the, it's controversial. Um, and the role uh, is limited to specific indications, and the specific indications that they s give is uh, that a regular treatment with inhaled corticosteroids improves the symptoms, improves lung function, quality of life, and reduces the frequency of exacerbations in COPD patients with an FEV1 less than 60% uh, predicted. They don't mention uh, any mortality death uh, benefit. Uh, and again, they, they mentioned the withdrawal from treatment may lead to exacerbations in some patients. Uh, regular treatment uh, does not modify long-term FEV1 decline, nor it modifies any mortality. Uh, a treatment with inhaled corticosteroid is associated with increased risk of pneumonia and thrush. Uh, and uh, they, they finish this off by saying uh, an ICS co uh, combined with a LABA is more effective then the individual components in improving lung function and health status and reducing exacerbations. It's evidence B in moderate category and then evidence A uh, in, in very severe COPD years. So with this background, um, I, we picked up this article and, and we just wanted to discuss uh, the role of uh, inhaled corticosteroid when we stopped inhaled corticosteroids after using it for a while and then see if it changed FEV1 decline, airway hyperresponsiveness, or quality of life uh, in these patients who used it for two and a half years. And, and when I reviewed the literature, literature it, n I don't think any study has been done reviewing patients who've been on ICS for this long and then followed them on, uh, uh, further for this long. So this is basically a follow-up study. So uh, to know a little bit about the follow-up study, we have to go back into the original study, so it's kind of like uh, two journal clubs for the price of one. <laughs> um, so this is the original study um, that came out uh, in 2009 in the Annals of Internal Medicine. Uh, so what they 
actually found was they um, they looked at effect of fluticasone with or without um, uh, semitrol in um, helping the um, following outcomes in COPD. So, okay. So what they did was, uh, again, their objective was uh, whether long-term inhaled corticosteroid therapy with or without uh, LABA actually helps uh, reduce uh, inflammation and improve pulmonary uh, functions in COPD. This was a double-blind um, parallel uh, placebo-controlled randomized trial. Uh, the entry criteria, they used a, a younger age, age 45 uh, to 75. These were current or former smokers, uh, more than 10 pack year history, and their lung functions fit into the gold stage two to three, so that would be moderate to severe uh, COPD. Uh, they excluded people with asthma, uh, and if they had received an inhaled corticosteroids within six months before uh, the random assignment. This actually was conducted at two university hospitals in Netherlands. They asked family practices uh, to electronically send uh, the diagnosis of COPD, uh, if, uh, of patients with COPD to them, and uh, they actually ended up with like 4,000 people, and, and then they, uh, the people who fit into the inclusion criteria, and they randomized them. Uh, so at the end of randomization, what they had was after excluding asthma and, and people getting, uh, getting ICS, they had 114 patients. So what they did was they, they designed it into four arms. So uh, the first one, uh, the, I'll start from the left of your screen here. Uh, the, the first arm of people actually would get fluticasone 500 BID for the first six months. So this was a 30 month long study, two and a half years. So they would receive a fluticasone for uh, BID for six months and then, then they'll get placebo for uh, the next 24 months. Uh, then the other group was uh, fluticasone twice daily for 30 months, and then a combination uh, of fluticasone and selmetrol for 30 months, and then placebo uh, for 30 months. So uh, again, uh, the study medications, uh, the whole thing was provided by GlaxoSmithKline uh, in Netherlands, and they actually had placebo inhaler that has lactose monohydrate. So uh, it kind of looked the same as uh, as taking um, uh, the other one. So, uh, and uh, at entry they did this independent randomization, uh, and they used a minimization uh, uh, method for randomization. Uh, Doctor Jolene, correct me if I'm wrong. I think what they what I understood by minimization is that they they calculated the imbalances of every randomized group and they summed them up and they distributed it equally in all the randomized groups. That's I think that's the minimization uh, that they use to to match all these groups. Okay. So, so but okay, sorry. Um, so the primary endpoint for the original study. So the first study primary endpoint was what they looked at were um, inflammatory cell counts in the bronchial biopsy, which I'm not going to talk about at all. Uh, the secondary outcome was an improvement in the spirometry hyperresponsiveness to methacholine and the MMRC and the, all the questionnaires that I talked about. Uh, follow up, uh, so in this study they actually did measure compliance in these patients. So they had these inhalers which had the, the counter on them. So that when they come in they did see the counter, they've been using it. But in, I'll mention in the, in the, in the next study, but the, the follow up study they didn't actually m measure compliance. They just asked their pharmacies to give them the information. Um, not direct compliance, they, they, they checked it indirectly. So follow procedures, uh, what they did was they, again, uh, smoking status reporting, medical mm -hmm. adherence, and then spirometry every three months. And the, in the original study, they did a bronch and the methacholine uh, challenge at baseline, and then six months, and then 30 months. Um, so, uh, so randomization, like I said, they actually end up at 114 patients. And then they selected only the 70%, the compliant patients, they had in patients, so they used those for analysis. So that left them with 101, and they divided them into four groups. Like I said, the protocol one for uh, 30 months, six months, and then 24 placebo, then a combination for 30 months and placebo for 24. I'm going through the facts because I, I don't know if I have time. But, um, okay, so patient characteristics at baseline uh, in the first study. So uh, I I highlighted the, the things that can 
jump up. But uh, other than that, it was pretty. Uh, uh, it looked pretty uniform throughout. There were a lot of more men than women uh, in this. And then, uh, if you look at the smokers, the placebo uh, group has more smokers. And then, uh, surprisingly, on the other end of the spectrum, the the people getting the combination BID have a lot of smokers. Um, and this actually comes into play in the follow-up study because we lose a lot of patients. Um, but other than that, the, pros, uh, the pre and the post bronchodilator, the change, everything actually was pretty matched. And the, the, the questionnaire scores were. So uh, the results of the study, what, what did they find? They, find, they found that uh, after two and a half years of maintenance therapy uh, with an ICS in COPD, reduced the rate of decline uh, and showed improvements in airway hyperresponsiveness, dyspnea, and health status. Uh, I'm, I missed, so uh, the airway hyperresponsiveness, hi how they checked it was they, so they did a methacholine challenge test, and what they would find was the dose that was required to decrease the FEV1 by 20%. So they w looked at the dose if it increased through the time, if it got, if, if they had to give more dose of methacholine to get that reduction, then they were getting more, less hyperresponsive. If they had to give less dose, then they were getting more hyperresponsive. Um, and then if you stopped uh, ICS in that group uh, in six months, that led to a relapse in bronchial inflammation and hyperresponsiveness, dyspnea, and then an accelerated FEV1 decline. So this second um, result actually brought up the question that after sp stopping in corticosteroid for just, after just six months causes us to have uh, like Niraj was saying, a uh, rebound uh, bronchial inflammation uh, and an accelerated FEV1 decline, what if we use it for longer, would we see the same thing? So this is uh, the first study, uh, I think I'll use my uh, curse, uh, my pointer here. Uh, so this is uh, the, the graph on the left is post bronchodilator FEV1, and then on the right is the methacholine. Uh, the PC20, like I said, the, the concentration used uh, needed to decrease the FEV1 by 20%. So uh, following the curve, this one that's just going down is a placebo. Um, and uh, so I'll, I'll start from here. Uh, so for take this one for 30 months. It doesn't really project well. Does it look okay here? You, can, you guys can see the, the landmark here too. The one on the top right, okay. Uh, so as you can see, the fluticasone uh, for 30 months and the combination actually do better than getting uh, fluticasone for uh, six months and then placebo or just placebo. So they have a decline more rapid uh, and the other two actually have declined but they don't have as fast a decline. So they said that attenuated the decline of, of FV1 by using this in corticosteroid. What they also said was it didn't really affect if you used a LABA with it or not, which is contrary to what we, the, the, the study that was earlier I, I discussed. And then they also found that patients who had used uh, the placebo had uh, worse outcomes with their uh, methacholine uh, challenge testing, uh, and the ones that used the steroids actually had improved. Uh, they, they, they used doubling doses, but that just means that they had to give more doses to uh, have the same response. So they did better with their hyper-responsiveness too. So then comes the follow-up study, uh, which I'm going to review here. So what they wanted to look at was if we use it for 30 months and we stopped in these patients, uh, what would happen? So again, like I said, the objectives here. Uh, so the method. So the entry criteria for the follow-up study uh, was uh, all the, part the participants in, in the first uh, study, and this was an observational perspective study, uh, and it carried out for five years. Um, in uh, the GL2, what they did was, once the GL1 completed, they asked the physicians uh, to treat patients according to what the guidelines that they saw fit. So they weren't obligated to treat well, kind of they were. They, 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 followed the, they would follow the guidelines, but uh, it, it was up to the physicians. Uh, and again, the, 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 the compliance was checked by the pharmacies, um, and what they would do is they would deliver uh, the inhaler or orocort or steroids, uh, the information, at the end of five years. Um, 
the post the post bronchodilator spirometry and uh, measures of quality of life were recorded at baseline so that would be 30 months after starting the GL1 and then oh sorry uh, so baseline before uh, GL1 at the end of GL1 and then uh, yearly in GL2 so five times in five years uh, the area hyper responsiveness to methacholine again was checked at baseline and then 30 months when GL1 ended and then at two years and five years So this is um, how uh, the patient's uh, distribution looked like. So I think we've already talked about the first two rows here. So this was GL1. Um, the interesting thing uh, and uh, thing is that when uh, the GL1 was started, there were 114 patients, and then they had 101 compliant patients, which they continued on. Um, at just 79 of those patients early on in, uh, out of the 101 started off GL2. And if you look at the end, just 58 finished this study. So you, they've lost almost half of the patients they started off with. Uh, and the biggest withdrawal was in the groups that actually used inhaled corticosteroids. So also the fact, uh, one more thing uh, that they uh, looked at was that I'll actually uh, explain that in the next, is that since for the follow-up study, they did not consider smoking as a confounder, uh, which is interesting. Uh, so they said smoking age is not a confounder because they did a post hoc analysis uh, of uh, the first study, and they said in the first study, smoking didn't really affect their FEV gun, so it wouldn't really affect them in, in the follow-up, so they said we won't consider that as a confounder. So they didn't even mention how, uh, well they do mention the smokers and, I, and if you see more smokers in the, in, in the inhaled corticosteroid in the original group actually are left at the end of the study. So that might affect what we discuss afterwards but just so you guys know. Um, but they do say in the statistical analysis that it, it's not a compound. Um, the outcomes for this study basically they wanted to see the annual decline in post-bronchodilator uh, post FEV1 during five years of follow-up uh, in GL2 compared with GL1. And the secondary outcomes uh, were uh, hyper-responsiveness and quality of life. So statistical analysis. So um, again, like I said, 114 and then one, uh, 101 were compliant. Um, and the differences in FEV1 decline was basically by two time variable. So what they did was they said, um, we're going to use a variable from zero, which is starting of GL1, to seven and a half years, which is the end of GL2. And then we're going to use five years, which is uh, two and a half at the uh, end of GL1 and at the end of GL2. So two time variables, which they compared when, uh, to see the difference in FEV1 decline. Um, the ICS use was actually divided into four groups, which is a little confusing, but uh, either they said every uh, compliant patient, which was 100% compliance with ICS in the follow-up group, the GL2. So, so this means that their, this is all depending on what their physician thought was fit in the follow-up. Like they could have stopped the inhaled corticosteroid if they didn't think they were getting benefit, or they would have continued it. So the GL2 uh, ICS use, then they divided this into all compliant patients whose physicians have stopped the inhaled corticosteroid, patients who used it. Uh, zero to fifty percent of the time, uh, or they used it fifty to one hundred percent of the time uh, during that uh, five-year follow-up part. Is that is that clear? Um, so statistical analysis. So what they did was they c they uh, compared daily dose of uh, I uh, the daily do the corticosteroids that they used. They would actually. Uh, reported in beclomethasone di I can't say it. it's a beclomethasone equivalent so whatever brand they use they they uh, equated it to beclomethasone and then they reported those doses um, so w the analysis they use these are the three uh, calculator for analysis i think dr jovni kind of simplified it the first one the kruskal volus test is basically when you don't have uh, a variable that actually follows a Gaussian curve. That's how you use that test, and the other two are basically when they follow it. So they used all these tests to analyze uh, the patient characteristic and ICS dose. 
Um, so we went over this already. So the characteristics, like I said, um, the difference is from, so uh, this one's a busy slide, but if uh, I'll walk you guys through this. So this is what we already talked about, the baseline GL1 group, and this is the at the start of the GL2 group. Uh, they never documented at the end how many uh, people were smokers or less. But at the start, if you can see, the difference is that were left, the, the 79 people that started GL2, they had the one in the uh, F30 and FS30, the steroid and the com combination group, had better FEV ones than placebo. That's one of the differences. Uh, the other difference was in the combination group, they were like more smokers uh, when in this group, uh, more s active smokers were left in this group, uh, and they had more back year history in the, in the cortical steroid group. So you never know what would have happened to these people in the follow-up. They might have received ICS or they might have just not received anything at all. So uh, talking about the results here, I think it's easy to uh, consider them, um, it's confusing dividing it into four, but um, if you consider these, the one, uh, the, the two uh, columns on the left as people who use ICS from 0 to 50 percent and the people who use it from 50 to 100 percent on the right. Uh, if you can see the number uh, that didn't use steroid or use steroid really uh, less frequently is 56 out of the 79 people. So that's almost uh, two-thirds of the people uh, that didn't use steroids. And, and then to just 23 had 50 to 100 percent use. So a majority of the people who, fo who had fo follow up in the five years, the physicians decided not to treat them with inhaled corticosteroids, and and not a lot actually got 100% uh, of inhaled corticosteroids. So, Or they didn't, yeah, sorry, yeah, or they didn't take it. That's the, uh, basically the, from the pharmacy, because they gave the information, maybe they didn't fill it, refill that right. So, uh, so these are the results in the, so A on, on the left is basically the people uh, who used uh, inhaled corticosteroids uh, for greater than 50%, uh, so 50 to 100, and then B, uh, sorry, uh, A is the people who used uh, it less than 50%, and then B is the people who used it uh, 50 to 100%. So if you see, yeah, so uh, did, what did I say? Sorry. Uh, yeah, that's right. No, opposite. So A is the one that actually used it more than 50%, and then B is the one that used it uh, less than, less than uh, zero to fifty percent. Okay, so if you see here, um, the mean uh, post bronchodilator FEV one. So if you see here, uh, the people that used placebo even after. Uh, so this is the placebo group: the um, the FS thirty, F thirty, and F six here, and then the same here. So. The people here are the people who actually use it 0 to 50 percent, and this is the one that uses it 50 to 100 percent. You see that the people who used, used it 0 to 50 percent, um, actually, the, the placebo actually who never got it and didn't get it in the follow-ups, continue to have an FEV band decline. Uh, and so did everybody in the follow-up group that didn't get anything. But interestingly, the people who got it 50 to 100 percent after this, the phase of GL1 that ended, continued to have an FEV1 decline as well. Now, you can argue either ways. Now, the thing, if you look at the, the y-axis here, if you see the people who got uh, just 0 to 50%, uh, they actually had a better FEV1, uh, 100 ml better than uh, the people who got it 50 to 100% to start off with. Uh, so does that mean that these guys were more, more of these guys were smoker and they had worsening disease even before and then because we lost so many people to follow up in the people in the intervention group in the GL2 the one using steroid was a low number does that affect our results here the authors 
actually do acknowledge the fact that because we had such less people in the F FS30 and the F30 group, the decline here, we can't really say that this decline means anything because we lost so many groups, the power actually went down, so they had to combine these both groups to give enough power to make it statistically significant, but it did still show that the FE1 continued to decline in patients who even kept using steroids in the follow-up period. And obviously it did decline in patients who didn't do it in the follow-up period. Is that clear? Did I confuse everyone? No? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the, the secondary outcomes. Uh, airway hyperresponsiveness. So again, they used methacholine and they used it uh, to see if there was decline in 20% in the FEV1. Uh, and what they found was that uh, just like they had predicted that there was the people who use inhaled corticosteroid in zero to 50% of the time uh, had worsening airway hyperresponsiveness. And interestingly, the original placebo group that used inhaled corticosteroids in the follow-up five years actually had improved hyperresponsiveness. So their score actually, a doubling dose actually went up. And then the questionnaires, so all of the points dropped for people um, who uh, did use uh, inhaled corticosteroids early on and used it zero to 50% of the time in the follow-up. All of their quality of life questionnaires uh, not scoring dropped down. So what they concluded in this uh, article was that discontinuation of the inhaled corticosteroids after long-term use of COPD in COPD seems to accelerate lung function decline uh, during follow-up together with deterioration in, in hyperresponsiveness as well as quality of life. Um, and they also concluded the benefits of 30 months of inhaled corticosteroid treatment on COPD progression were confined just when they were getting active treatment. Not So this weren't long-lasting effects. That's what they emphasized in this uh, study. Uh, deterioration in uh, hyperresponsiveness during the five years after uh, the stopping the inhaled corticosteroid had only been earlier studied in asthma and short-term treatment in COPD. Uh, so the strengths of the study, it's a long-term perspective design. They continue to monitor patients in these five years, although they continue to lose patients as well. Uh, and then they... Uh, got this data on the lung function decline, uh, hyperresponsive and quality of life. So the limitation, like I said, uh, only half of the patients that were initially randomized uh, seven and a half years ago uh, ended up finishing up the study. Um, and like I said, the inhaled corticosteroids, people taking inhaled corticosteroids 50 to 100 percent of the time uh, were really low. Um, so and then they didn't check compliance directly, but it was ch checked indirectly from pharmacies. Um, and they did mention that due to small subgroup of patients using the steroids during the GL2, it was difficult to detect a difference in annual decline of in FEV1. Um, pneumonia and exacerbation rates were not recorded because they were monitoring uh, surrogate endpoint, which was an FEV1. And smoking and age were not considered as a co uh, not a co confounder, co-founders. Um, um, so what I wanted to focus on was uh, reviewing in articles which actually involve surrogate endpoints. So surrogate endpoints basically is a lab measurement uh, or a physical sign which actually would substitute for a clinical endpoint. So it's, it's harder and it's more expensive and it's, it requires more population to do a study with clinical, meaningful clinical endpoints. So we come up with these surrogate endpoints like FEV1 for lung function decline or cholesterol for risk of um, coronary artery disease or CD4 for treatment of HIV. So these surrogate endpoints help us in uh, substituting the endpoint here. They used an FEV1 decline as a surrogate endpoint uh, regarding the COPD progression. Uh, when I looked at how surrogate endpoints work, is it, it's beneficial and it can be uh, harmful too. In beneficial points, like you can have smaller studies and you can get drugs approved by just measuring a surrogate endpoint, which you think links to a clinical endpoint. But on the other side, there's a, a famous example of milrinone, that milrinone improved a surrogate endpoint, which was hemodynamic parameter, but in the end, when they looked at the clinical endpoint, 
they found that actually increased mortality. So w whenever we are reviewing a, a study which has surrogate endpoints, we should always know or, or look for whether or not it, it independently is a substitute for the endpoint that we would uh, like to see in our patients. Uh, I looked at these studies, uh, post-bongodiet FE1 decline in COPD in patients who they had these uh, uh, trials where they were having uh, interventions or placebo. So all these trials actually did show that the placebo group had a decline. So the TORCH trial, the lung health study one, the lung health study two, and, and the isolated trial the Euroscope trial had, had a worsening yearly decline in FEV1 in placebos because they just took smokers. So I, I guess smoking, uh, well, we know smoking actually uh, has faster uh, decline in lung function, more air limitation related to smoking. So I guess FEV1 decline does have a strong association for the surrogate end marker with COPD. Now, while we do uh, establish this, uh, how precise or applicable is this study uh, or using this surrogate endpoint to our clinical practice? Uh, does uh, our likely treatment benefits like inhaled corticosteroids uh, worth the potential harm which would be pneumonia um, and costs associated with therapy? And lastly, um, again, I, I'm just questioning the first thing, like if everyone, we see these studies which are uh, opposite to each other. Some say there is FE1 decline, some say there isn't, some say FE1 uh, improvement is related with Im improved in exacerbations or mortality, some don't. Do we need to have better understanding of COPD phenotypes and whether or not we just need to study FE1 in, in different phenotypes? Um, so those are the questions I had at the end of the study. Um, and I don't know if you guys have more questions because I'm done. Uh, yeah. They did go back and actually they asked the pharmacies to give them data on antibiotics that was prescribed uh, for these patients and death. They actually, at the end, the 58 patients that they were, were left with, there was one death and it was associated with pneumonia in the ICS group, but they found that he had like a post-obstructive pneumonia from a cancer. But I they were equal. They, they, they didn't find any difference in, in, in prescribing the antibiotics in the pharmacy. N no, they just mentioned the, the oral antibiotic I think. Mm -hmm. oh, did I miss that slide? I'm sorry. I think I missed if I miss this table. This actually is a good one. So um, just focus on the, the third and the fourth column, the 0 to 50 and the 50 to 100. So if you see the F6 people who took 0 to 50 had more decline than the people who took it, which is what they were saying. And then the F31, which didn't take it, had more decline than the people who took it, which, again, they, they said would help. But again, if the in the FS30 group, which were taking the combination, had a decline when they weren't taking it and had a decline even when they were taking it. 
So they covered that up at the end when they were putting the conclusion, saying that we didn't have enough people. But they, they actually, the, the little a on the top of 72 means that this is statistically significant, the, the decline in, in this group here. But I don't think they ever say that, like, the 73 ml per year is statistically more than 37. Yeah, they don't. So they, they, don't, ever, they don't ever prove that these are different. Mm -hmm. They're different to look at. Yeah, the numbers they, are yeah higher, they don't prove, but yeah. They don't ever, they, they mm -hmm. don't ever show. placebo who didn't take it and didn't take it? Uh, but they took it. But the placebo is the one who didn't take it for two and a half years and then decided to take it for the next five years. So this is, see how they, they took it 50 to 100 percent in the following five years. This is GL2 now. The placebo, the, they're grouped out placebo because they were placebo in GL1. So they improved after taking in the recording. So that goes. That's what I uh, what I showed at. So if uh, this is the so this is these are the studies like the big ones. So this is if you don't use anything. These are the placebos in all these studies, and they yeah like fifty five like fifty yeah fifty or sixty. Per year. I saw like in healthy individuals like 30 mLs a year we uh, lose it. 30? Thank you, Dr. Hagab and Dr. Zildi, for helping me with the presentation, and that's it. So. <laughs> <laughs>